Greetings. Welcome back to ITR Live. I'm your host, Chris Hagenow, here from Studio 130 in West Des Moines. I am joined here in studio today with everyone's favorite, John Hendrickson, and also Chris Ingstad. We have got an action-packed episode today and some very fired-up uh, podcast participants here. So, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. John, I'm glad to see you. See you back. Yes, yeah. You made it back from the swamp. Yep. Yeah, there. John, tell us about your trip to the swamp. Yeah, I was in uh, D.C. Thursday and Friday and, and for, a, for a conference and got back early Saturday morning because of delays of no, storms true. Yeah, that started in D.C. and we're across the Midwest, so. Okay. But did they, did they, did they get to you or did you stand strong when you're out there? Did you, did you stay strong to limited government, free I did, market yeah. capitalism? Yeah. Or did yeah. You? Yeah. Well, I, um, I, I defended my, my style of conservatism. Amen. So we want to hear. Yeah. Which is what? Say some, you know what? Sum it up for the listeners. What yeah. is John Hendrickson conservatism? <laughs> I mean, we talk a lot about this person yeah, and that person's that's... conservatism. I, frankly, maybe we just need to skip that. What is John Hendrickson conservatism? Well, my, mine is modeled after the old right conservatives of the 20s and 30s, which limited government, uh, a strong states, uh, you know, reserved foreign policy, uh, an economy that's protected by tariffs that promotes good wages and protecting manufacturers and limiting immigration and, you know, a re- adherence to the Constitution. You know, the 1920s was interesting. They actually said that uh, the conservatives almost worshipped the Constitution, and we don't see that today. No. And there was a huge battle between conservatives and progressives over over how we would look at the Constitution, and, and so you can look back at uh, debates of, you know, someone like William Howard Taft versus Woodrow Wilson and, and uh, uh, Calvin Coolidge, and and then you have progressives like Louis Brandeis, who was on the Supreme Court, so, but that, you know, that's, that's a whole other podcast that I think people would be interested in learning more about. Well, I know I'd be interested in it. You know. Um, you know, the... Uh, Warren Harding, one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, well, that's good. I think we should start building a whole, you know, like... Didn't we decide that was going to be paywall material, though? No, oh, that's right. Okay. Well, you'll yeah, have to go to itrfoundation.org and, <laughs> and go to the, the extra Hendrix yeah. subscriber-only content or however it might be. Well, you know, one of the things you... I, I'm going to use this to kind of pivot here, John, but... Um, I wanted to get your take on this because uh, specifically on the uh, foreign policy piece of that mm-hmm. is you may or may not have noticed, but we're going through a presidential primary nominating uh, cycle right now for the caucuses. Uh, the first of the major cattle calls for the presidential candidates was on Friday at the family leader event hosted by, well, family leader, but also moderated by Tucker Carlson, someone that I know you have a special yes, affinity yeah. for. Um it would, did, did you watch very many of these? Because I, I think they're available online of these interviews of the different candidates. I, I watched a few. I haven't watched all of them yet. But okay. uh, I uh, thankfully, they were uh, uh, somewhere on C-SPAN, which I watched this weekend. And I just noticed that on Tucker Carlson's website, they, they have them there oh, now. Oh, they do? Yes, okay. yeah. I didn't know. Because I so, didn't get to see them all either. I was there for a while. Yeah. Um, but the one that seemed to draw the most uh, media attention was the uh, former vice president, Mike Pence for the interview and, and really kind of got skewered on the question and answer on Ukraine. Yes. And we've talked about this before, John, which was, you know, what's the, <clears throat> what, what do re- specifically conservatives want to see out of this, what's going on in Ukraine? And, and I think where, where uh, Vice President Pence sort of got tripped up was, a little too much over here on funding Ukraine mm-hmm. and all of that and not enough on what's happening here at yeah. home. And did you, like, I want to hear your take on that though, because well, I, it fits with some of the things we've talked about. Absolutely. And I, I think Tucker uh, in that question exposed the vice president for his neocon foreign policy beliefs, Yeah, wh- which is good. I mean, I, I don't agree with what, the good what, that he exposed them or good that he good had that he the exposed neo- them. Oh, okay, yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and you could tell that, um, uh, the vice president, the former vice president, was not very comfortable, and uh, 
you know, he had an article before the family leader event in the Wall Street Journal arguing for more aid to Ukraine, which is becoming a quagmire. And of course, I, listeners probably saw the headline where Biden's going to call up some uh, uh, troops to, to be stationed over in Europe. And so, I mean, this is a, this is a pretty serious situation. But I, I think when the vice president said, the former vice president said, it's not my concern. Yeah. When Tucker Carlson asked him about all the problems going on yeah. in American cities. And, you know, and I, I think that's one thing that uh, the political class doesn't seem to understand is that the American people are wondering, when are you going to take care of us first? We don't take care of our own border, but we're worried about the borders of all these other countries. And, you know, we're, we're having, uh, and Tucker said this, I don't know if it was in the interview with uh, Vice President Pence or someone else, but, you know, Americans are dying by the hundreds of thousands with fentanyl that's coming across the border, and nobody's taking that seriously. And, and people are starting to wonder, you know, when are we going to start taking our care of our own first? And, and so I, I think uh, I, I really applaud the family leader for having Tucker Carlson ask mm-hmm. those questions because you, you would not get those questions from anybody else. Do you, think, do you think family leader gave Tucker some direction or do you think Tucker just took those things where he, want to go, where he wanted to go? I think he took them where he wanted to go because as I watched each of the interviews, they're sort of different in how he asked the questions. And I, there was, uh, and I haven't seen all of them, but there, there had been some questions I would like to have seen Tucker ask that, uh, as far as I've seen so far, weren't addressed. But um, I, I think these candidates should. They yeah. should have to explain Ukraine and, and other issues. And, and, uh, and I, I think Tucker Carlson's one of the more uh, sane voices out there uh, on public policy and, and conservatism right now. I, I am. I like to see the hard questions asked, and specifically challenging the conventional wisdom, which I think on Ukraine, which is U.S. involvement and and so on and so forth. So I think it's good. I and you know I'm a big Tucker fan too, John. I, I thought he went. Felt like he started out wanting the fight with him on them mm-hmm. a little bit, and I thought you know it's. I don't know where you draw the line on that, right? I mean, sometimes those events are just every candidate gets up, gives their speech, and that's it, which you yeah. don't learn a lot because anybody can, you know, give a speech at that level. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I still, like, I don't know. I I, it, I don't want to say it felt mean-spirited, but it's almost as if he walked in like, I'm going to have a fight with, with Pence on these issues because they got into it on January 6th too, which, yeah. And it felt like Pence, which just wasn't quite prepared for either one of those, which no, he probably he thought should he should have been. He probably thought he was going to get softballs yeah. and then you're and not then, going to from Tucker Carlson. No, no. And I, I think it's, uh, some of these candidates, they, frankly, they get a free pass. Well, and, I, uh, they shouldn't. I, I, mean, I guess my, my big takeaway is that in, in kind of visiting with some people where I was in the back of the room, um, the, there is a split in the Republican Party. There were folks that were very, that really enjoyed what, what Vice President Pence was saying. Mm-hmm. And I saw one guy who was a, clearly a, a military veteran that kind of walked by and he was like, yeah, you know, we got we to do this. And then there were others kind of where I was at. I was like, yeah, no, I don't really want all of my money and potentially, uh, you know, sons and daughters' lives yeah. going. Like, like uh, that's not my war. Yeah. And so I think there's really a especially on the conservative end of the spectrum, working out yeah. what it is that we uh, really believe because we're not that far removed from a, a George W. Bush style of, of neoconservative right. activism around the globe. And that's not where yeah. the party is at no, anymore. And no. trying to trying to figure out exactly what is the the well, no center one, of gravity for that. And no it's one, interesting. No one has explained, either Republican or Democrat, who are Ukraine hawks, what is the strategic interest and objective of the United States to be doing this? Depleting our munitions? Yes. and Because um, oh, that seems like where we're, you know, well, we that, are. That was yeah. that, exactly. There was an article um, in the Washington Times front page uh, Friday, I believe, addressing that, that we're just, you're, we're draining our resources. Yeah. And, and so I, I think, uh, you know, as this caucus and as the primary unfolds, 
uh, I think all candidates need to yeah. respond to these questions yep. and not just give flowery speeches and recite, you know, passages from the Declaration of Independence. And, you know, I, I think I think the Republican base has moved on from this r- meaningless rhetoric yeah. at times. Yeah, I, I, they, they want more. Okay, well. <clears throat> I didn't think we were talking about Krauss yet. Oh, boy. That was, that's good. Are you ready, though? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let's get it. Let's let's go. Okay. So it's time to get down to business, gentlemen. Uh, it's time to talk about soccer. Mm. And uh, maybe some of our more regular listeners are going to know where we're going with this. But um, the uh, Kyle Krause, uh, come and go family, former president, has since turned it over to his uh, son, recently sold the company. But there's a, an article in the Des Moines Register today. It's a really well-written article. Very well-written article. Uh, Tyler Jett was the author. Kudos to him for, for writing a good piece. Clearly had done a lot of work on it. But how um, is the, the Kyle Krause is coming back to specifically Polk County and the city of Des Moines for additional taxpayer incentives for the construction of of his new soccer stadium in downtown Des Moines. Right. They want more. They want more. Now, they're already in it for, I think, somewhere in the $60 million range, but it's it's all very difficult to ascertain, right? Exactly some, how some much. Of, and I'm going to let you kind of take this over, Chris, because you've, you've put work in on this. But um, I'm just the one that's the most offended by these sort of things. Well, I like soccer quite a bit. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm look, generally glad to have a higher level soccer franchise here, but my, well, you know, soccer, my squad's captain quit this weekend. Basically after the first week of training camp, he went in and said, the players, um, the rest of the players the team aren't good enough. I don't want to be a part of this. And they gave him his outright release. Oh, good. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, but, but anyway, look, tell the, us a the, little bit about what we learned from this article and yep. where things are at. Look, the idea is that the the uh, Kraus, uh, the Kraus group, the Kraus family, uh, through whatever organization, um, has been awarded a uh, uh, professional soccer uh, franchise, kind of the 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 AAA, uh, right below Major League Soccer, right? So it'd be sort of a soccer equivalent to the I Cubs, somewhere in that, somewhere in that range. ish, yes, yeah. higher level minor league, yeah. Okay. And 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 as part of that, they would like to kind of develop an entire stadium district with the you know uh, hotels and restaurants and, yep. and and of course a a stadium worthy of hosting a, a, a professional soccer team six thousand seats yeah uh, and so again as you said Chris it's a little tough to get the your your arms around all the numbers uh, partly because some of the um, awards are are contingent on money from over here and so um, and again, there's 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 a difference between what's sort of been agreed to and what's actually been been you know signed off and and you know locked in by a contract. Yeah. But the reality is that the state of Iowa is in for about 24 million. Uh, Polk County's in for about seven million. The city portion is is maybe the hardest to get your arms around what exactly it is. But they're in too for some level of uh, of, of what's essentially. Uh, TIF rebates or, or other tax incentives based on some of the growth, right? We know how you feel about TIF and, well, and tax I mean, the, incentives. The, the whole problem is that the, the question that has to be asked in all these things is not would, would you like to have a stadium district or would it be cool to have a soccer team? The question is, if we don't incentivize this, would the would the thing right. still go? Right. And and then, of course, also like, well, even if it's no and we decide we need to make the investment, uh, is that actually a good deal right. for the taxpayer, or are you just subsidizing? Right, and and so you've got you've got you've got Iowa governments already committing tens of millions of dollars to this thing, okay, and now they realize there is a a shortfall. Uh, costs have gone up. It's already been delayed. By the yeah. way, we're already supposed to have the franchise. It's not coming for another year or two, okay. Yeah. Um, but they're looking for somewhere between thirteen and sixteen million dollars more. Uh, one of the places they propose to get to 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 bridge that gap, Chris, is uh, when they moved their headquarters from West Des Moines to downtown Des Moines, they got a pretty big TIF agreement, uh, re- po- property tax rebates. Yeah, brand new glass, you know, right. uh, in vogue architect comes in and does it on the end of the Western Gateway. Right, and so so uh, I believe that's that's about an $11 million uh, set of agreements, and they'd like more, maybe 13 yeah. to $16 million. Yeah. Uh, so, so, I mean, you go, goodness gracious, 
you know, and I'm not trying to be in anyone's pocketbook, but but a lot of this is information. Uh, this information is public. Is is one the 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 price tag they were sort of shopping around the family business for was about two billion dollars. Now, even if even if the the agreement came in a little less than that, that's still substan- substantial cash, right? Do, do right? Des Moines homeowners need to be kicking into somebody who just sold the business for for two billion? Right. I, I would say they you probably just to set don't. the stage. So come and go. The you know every Iowan's familiar with that yep. convenience store brand. Um, a few months ago, it was announced they're selling the entire company mm-hmm. off to a Utah, Utah yeah, based, Utah, Utah Utah Maverick. based yeah. So those will be completely changing the, the brand and who owns it. And so that will no longer be an Iowa company. I, I suspect that the Krauss Gentle Corporation continues to exist in some form. But so, yeah. so we're talking about um, Iowa based taxpayers contributing tens of millions of dollars already and, and north of 10 million more to subsidize development that a billionaire wants to do. Correct. Okay. And, and you know, the, the challenge that you see so many of these things is, is those agreements sometimes fall short. It, I, I, it's some, I don't know, giant piece of irony that in the same sort of news feed that talks about them seeking more, it also talks about the failure of Des Moines' uh, Wells Fargo development deal, right? Wells Fargo is moving their employees from downtown Des Moines to West Des Moines. Mm-hmm. And is therefore foregoing like about four million dollars of, of planned tax incentives. So they've been they've been they've been receiving uh, for twenty years, and now they're just going to skip the last three or four years of it and move on. Yeah. In other words, you've laid out how many millions of dollars Des Moines. And what did that give you? They're still pulling up and moving stuff to right. to West Des Moines. I, I don't know if they can see the and notices the irony in that, or just finish reading the story and it points out that the Kraus family owns a soccer team in Europe. I was going to say they own a team that plays in uh, Serie A, the top league of, of Italy, but that's not true because they got relegated. Okay, so yeah. they, they dropped down a tier. Um, but it talks that that team, and this is from public documents over about two and a half years, has lost over $200 million. So, you know, I would have, I'd be really hesitant if I'm in Iowa with taxpayer dollars going to a billionaire to try to do the same thing that, that they have, you know, lost hundreds of millions of dollars at in Europe. I mean, it's a, you guys, it's the same thing. Yeah. It, it, it's same. not like, well, that's a different, that's a different business. It is the same business. Yeah. It is the same business. So I, they've, they've sought these sort of incentives in Italy and been told no. That's, that's what, that's what and, we're told. Yes. But, and sought them here in Iowa and have been granted many of them and, now we're coming back for even more. And I get their yeah. costs have, have increased. I mean, that's the economy that Does we're it pay in. off to the taxpayer increase, though? No, it like, cer- is it a better, certainly b- doesn't. Because but, the, the price tag went up on the developer, the tax, that doesn't well, make it, sense. But I, no, it shouldn't. But that's why one more reason why local government should be a little bit leery of these projects and handing out the checks to try and incentivize something. It's like, guess what, guys? This might come in over budget. And they're going to come back and ask you for more. And delayed. And, and you know, the Merle- So, like, let's not just blame the... the the Krauses for this. I'm, I'm not really trying to pick on them. I mean, they, you know, well, or, but, but it's, but it is, it is the headline today. It is the story today. And these yeah. are the facts. Well, I, I mean, I blame the, the, the folks that are handing the checks out time and again, that if you got a project, let's hand out more checks for them. Let's hand out more incentives. Well, more, a, and, and so why wouldn't they come asking for some handouts if they're being given out all over the place? Let's go get ours too. Yeah. I mean, I thought, they're, there's, oh, go ahead. I, I just, I'll close the last sort of piece of, of, of that I thought was particularly interesting in there. Again, very good article in the register. Go read it. Um, but one of the Polk County supervisors, yes. uh, one, he was he was actually sort of saying like, well, you know, we essentially, we don't have an endless pot of money and there's other projects that are right. priorities. And he talked about the Des Moines Airport and, and needing to expand or further develop that. And Chris, you've got some experience in that well, industry. No, I, but but I, I guess, and I'm not weighing in on, on that project necessarily, but I would suggest that the airport probably serves a much bigger percentage of the population than a soccer stadium. Well, I it, mean, a soc- Chris, a soccer stadium has 6,300 people, yeah. uh, you know, however many home games a year you have. Uh, the airport traffic is going to be way more I, than 6,300 people. Think, I think it's about 3 million passengers a year are going through the Des Moines Airport. So this was this So was, I'm glad that Polk County is 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 potentially weighing this go well, you know, what would be a better use? What would serve more people in our community? A, 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 an airport right. that's sort of open to the public or a billionaire developer soccer and, stadium. And, okay, so I, with not a great track record of running soccer teams by the way. Yeah. Uh so this is uh Polk County supervisor Bob Brownell, good friend of mine. I think he's a very thoughtful, conscientious Supervisor, and I think you would have many people in both parties would agree mm-hmm. with that. 
And so he's looking at this, what's our rate of return in this investment and looking at the the Polk County or the, the Des Moines Airport project. And that's not, a. I know it carries the name Des Moines, but that is the primary airport for at least half of the state of Iowa, that if you're flying out of somewhere, you're coming to Des Moines. And so it is a major economic driver. And the point he made is that you can draw a straight line from investments in the airport to the economic development of the region because businesses want to have reliable, easy air service, both on passengers and on cargo. I mean, Des Moines has a sizable cargo operation. Yeah, you know, you know who Moines. else wants, wants that and enjoys it? Like the regular taxpayer. Just the regular. I mean, yes, that's exactly right. And we folks get so excited when there's a deal on an Allegiant flight or a Southwest flight or someplace going somewhere. You know what? You're using a taxpayer-funded airport to do it. And we can we can debate the necessity of the project or this or that. I think they happen they they clearly do need to make significant investments and probably need a whole new terminal. I don't love where they landed on their plan. I wish they were actually in moving it around, but whatever. But but, but, an, but that's air, a legitimate... an airport that is is basically already maxed at capacity, right? Right. Is much more of, in my mind, a, a public service or public good that government oh. might want to be in the business of funding than a soccer stadium. Well, I would say an airport is not not dissimilar from basic infrastructure. Correct. Is that you have a highway system that brings goods and services and people in and out of your communities across the state. An airport does just that, moves people around. It's basic infrastructure. You fund it. It's got to work, right? Because we'd be in, it would not be fun and it would, it would, it would impact the region if we didn't have that airport or if it didn't function right. Now, you cannot say the same thing for a soccer stadium. You know, we have not had high level minor league soccer in Des Moines and we have made it this far. We probably can get by. Now, one thing that this project is going forward is cleaning up a Superfund site down there and it's a big vacant area uh, south of MLK uh, Parkway downtown. It's, yes, a good development. Nobody is saying that 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 isn't an improvement on what's there. If it's there. such a good development, they can probably uh, pay for it out of its future well, profits, not have the taxpayer kick in subsidies to start with. And, and I, I guess maybe the article doesn't directly say it, but are we trying to say that this project's not going to move forward if they don't get this money? I, I don't know, but if you are want more money, you might sort of portray it that way. Yeah. I, I, I just, it's, maybe, I guess what it is, is on a, what we have been talking about this, for frankly almost a year guys we've been talking about developer agreements we've been talking about tiff we've been talking about these things that cities and counties do it do to pick winners and losers to try and generate whatever their preferred piece of economic development is whether it even is or not we've been talking about things like but four tests mm -hmm. and trying to say that there is a better way than having cities and counties across the state of Iowa pick out what they want to fund and using these these special schemes. This is just at a very, very large level. This is Iowa's largest county, largest city, doing it to the tune of a several hundred million dollar project, right? And, and so we use this and we see it and we get frustrated here. And I know a lot of other Iowans get frustrated to see it at such a large level. But don't be mistaken, this is not just a soccer stadium in downtown Des Moines. This is in every community across the state of Iowa. But we've, we've already got, a, to a smaller extent, we've got a, a hockey stadium and, and an old mall coming, right? Exactly, and so on and so forth. And it's not sports arenas. Sometimes it's a, a community recreation center. Sometimes it's a uh, even a, uh, an entertainment district. It's on and on, and it's, it's small projects. But cities and counties do this. They go in, they pick out the developers they like and the projects they like, and whoever's connected and whoever puts together the application gets the free handout check. And we're trying to explain to Iowans that it doesn't have to be this way. So herein, we've got an, ex an exceptionally large example. So if you're frustrated about a soccer stadium being paid with, in large part, taxpayer dollars, maybe not, maybe in terms of the grand scheme of thing, not quite you know, it's not like half of it, but it's a big chunk of the money. Mm -hmm. If you're frustrated by that and don't think that's what taxpayer dollars ought to be used for, then you ought to be frustrated all the way down the line, not just in Iowa's largest city. Yep. So 
I know, Chris, you're, you've been digging into this and you're going to continue to have some things to say on it. We'll probably write on it. We'll have some good stuff to say about it. And um, hopefully uh, state lawmakers are paying attention when we talk about the need for things like TIF reform and developer agreements is that this is what we're talking about. And it's not just you and your local mayor and your local city council who really want a project. So we're going to turn a blind eye to it in my own community. And then I don't care when I get to Des Moines for the legislative session is that this stuff Sometimes they're good deals. A lot of times they're not. And a lot of times they, they ignore the pitfalls coming in the future that, you know what, it all sounds good when they make the pitch for you. And then you come to find out we have cost overruns and they're going to come back for more. Or we, we moved to the next town over because it made more. Right. Well, right. That, that, an, I mean, another, another deal or, or whatever else. Yeah, we're going to move our corporate headquarters, you know, three miles down the road because we got a better deal on our, on our incentives. Or we're going to incentivize. What do you What do you do when it's the same organization that does that and then wants the soccer stadium? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and competing medical clinics, right across the street from each other, they get it, it's hard to say. It's hard to say that wouldn't have happened uh, when they I mean, when they both just, build multi story. Uh, yeah. Okay. So if we do anything here, we're just trying to shine some light on that this happens all the time, from large scale to small scale, and it's time for at a minimum, a great deal of sunlight to be shine on, on yeah. all of it. So, okay. Did I, did we, did we cover that? Yeah. So make sure you're checking out. We'll, we'll have more of this <clears throat> at itrfoundation.org. I know that Chris is going to do uh, some writing on it and uh, it, it's just, it, and definitely check out the article in the Des Moines Register. And I will link to that yes. in the uh, description uh, on the podcast. So John, is it good to be back? Yes. Yeah. Do you is. feel? Do you feel the freedom, the the free market, re, uh, limited government here? Is this better than D.C.? It is. You know, I was surprised uh, how many people were still wearing masks. Oh yeah. In the D.C. area. My goodness. I mean, wow. I, I, did, I it was amazing. I I just couldn't believe yeah. it. Well, not here. This is freedom. No. You can breathe it in. Yeah. It'll smell like smoke, but you can breathe freedom right here. So good. All right. Well, we were we're we're gonna I- endeavor to give you more than one episode a week around here. So um, here we are with number one. We'll see if we can't come back around again. So John, be ready. I will. I need. Yep. I need. Yeah. It, it, the the folks are counting on you. So, all right. Well, uh, with that, I think we are about out of time. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Share with your friends. Don't forget to check out the article and uh, and keep coming back to check out what we've written on the subject as well. And with all that, we will see you next time on ITR Live.